just making sure I'm actually streaming before I start randomly talking to myself. And we are live, and that's good. It's always good to make sure that one is live before one starts talking to oneself. I just need to get into the right stupid... Okay, we're just going to give everybody some time to log in, get ready, and watch. I'm just going to share the link directly to the stream so people can watch it directly from Discord if they so choose. And I'm just going to pop this in over here. Okay, so this is the long-awaited Q&A with Rhino the author of Chrysalis, which earlier this week we managed to catch up with and now we're maintaining. I'm just going to wait a little bit and wait for people to log in before we get too far into this. But I don't know whether you want to say hi, and that's where we'll wait, Rhino. So everyone can hear your charming voice. Yep. Right, so the way this is going to work is I've got some questions written up. I mean, I spent an inordinate amount of time writing these questions. It must have been at least 10 minutes of my time writing these questions. I put a lot of thought into them. Um, I have some questions done by the guys on Discord. And then we'll also, I'll try to keep up to date with what's happening in the chat. If somebody has a question, I'll hopefully see it. And then we can ask the question, if appropriate. Yep, yep. I'll just take a couple minutes for everybody to get logged in. But I hope everybody's watching. I took or went and I got the appropriate background for this. Just for everybody to watch while we talk. Because, you know, I don't have a camera or anything. So I went and I found the stream. And there is a link in the description down below. And it's nice, calming and fun. I think it's a nice, nice ambience for, for this interview. Especially regarding the novel. It's one of those gel end farms. Me personally, I have half a dozen end farms in my garden, but I'm pretty sure that I want to be recorded. No, no. And you don't get cameras that small that you can just put into the nests. Uh, just give me a second. Can you... S uh, right, there we go. Just speak, Rana. Can you come through? Hello, hello. There we go. I think I had you muted there. <laughs> okay, and um, Rhino, you can also feel free to have a little chat in the chat if you want. Or you can just chat through the microphone, whichever is easiest for you. Now, if I sound <sighs> slightly different, it's because I'm not in my normal, nice, proper pose for talking. I'm sort of slouching because it is late for me. Yeah, thank you for staying up. No, not a problem. It was uh, it was a bit of a challenge trying to figure out what the best time would be, you know, which would be most convenient for the most people. Yeah, right. It's 7 a.m. here. I mean, we, we, we've got a, a stacked deck here. I mean, we've got people from America. We've got people from Europe, which is the same sort of time zone as me. And then all the way over on the other side, we've got your stupid Aussies. <laughs> we are a little uh, inconveniently positioned. Well, well... You're the first ones to see the new day. So it's like time travel. That's uh, true. Okay. I do find watching these ants surprisingly soothing. Maybe it's not that surprising, to be honest. Well, no, you've spent, I don't know how long, but 300 chapters writing about them. So. <sighs> that is true. Right, so for well, those listening, if you want to ask a question, feel free to do so in the chat or give me a DM on Discord. I would prefer a DM on Discord because then I can go back and easily see it. Okay, I, I think we can start now. Anyway, I did interrupt you. I do apologize. You were about to say something, probably very important. It's absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. Happy to be interrupted by that voice. So okay. smooth, man. Well, thank you. Um, but yes, please also, if you are 
aren't subscribed, please subscribe if possible and put a like on this video. It does help the algorithm, does help the channel. Uh, there are links down below for various things if you want to have a squiz there and possibly support myself or Rhino. It doesn't really matter which. Okay. <laughs> so are we all ready? Are we all eager for the questions? I am prepared. Okay. Question number uno. You come from a country with numerous murder bugs. So why did you choose ants? That's a surprisingly good question, actually. We have so many. Well, I mean, I actually also come from a country with a lot of very dangerous animals. So I do know that Australia has a surprisingly amount of big murder bugs around. It's, it's amazing how blasé we get. Like, I've got my... Redback spiders uh, with their webs all over the place. And I have to kill three before I can get my lawnmower. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But uh, why did I pick ants? Um, I think just because I had an interest in them, I had knowledge about them. Um, I had an ant farm myself hmm. with a queen that I'd captured in the wild and done a bit of research about them so i just had a lot of info and i thought they'd be interesting it's a different type of story as well because instead of having your sort of solo tough as nails hero or main character um an ant would naturally come into contact with his with his colony and you'd have a sort of an opportunity for a powerful social dynamic which um, does make a, big, a bit of a that change was, Hmm. Look, there's a few things that I wanted to do differently with this when I started writing this novel, and that was one of them. Cool. Um, I, I do have a list of questions, but this is more of a conversation. So, I mean, we may go off topic and we may move on to other questions and cover other topics. And I think that's fine. It's a bit more organic than forced to answer questions. No, no, that's fine. Absolutely. And I may ask a question that might briefly touch on a topic we spoke about before, and that's fine as well. So how disappointed... I'm looking at a question in the chat, which actually reminded me of something I wanted to ask, but I forgot to write down. It was how disappointed were you that they chose New Zealand to record and video the Lord of the Rings trilogy instead of Australia? Oh, man, I was a huge fan of Lord of the Rings uh, ever since my youth. There was a period there where I read it basically every year uh, for 10 years running. So I was a big fan, but um, I do have to admit, we really don't have the landscape to film it in Australia. We are very, very flat. Yes. And deserty. And there's plenty of desert. Like if they had any desert scenes, we would have nailed it. But uh, no, I wasn't really all that mad. It was kind of nice that uh, it was in this corner of the world at all. Hmm. I mean, I, I personally is. enjoyed the, the, the trilogy. I've also been a fan for the book since my teenage years, which I, I think a lot of people were. I mean, I, I wasn't quite as dedicated as to you. I read it twice. Um, <laughs> That's enough for most people. Yes. Um, so I'm just have something wrong with us. Personally, one of the things I found fascinating after the movies came out is people would start going on about, you know, the book it was such an easy read. It was so quick. It just sort of piled the pages on. And the Lord of the Rings trilogy may be many things, the books. But an easy read is not one of them. No, they're very dense. It's dense, like and it's with... a bit of a slog. You have to work for it. Yeah, it's one of the things... Like he had J.R. Tolkien, he had such a horrible time trying to get the books published. Well, and that was one of the things I always, that's one of the lessons I sort of took from the, from the story of Lord of the Rings and how it was written and how it was published was that um, a lot of people, they don't actually know what stories people actually want to read. Yeah. Especially in he that was told time. it was, especially that time. Yeah. But he was, he was told nobody would want to read this book. There's no chance. It's too long. It's too wordy. It's too out there. And it turns out that people were ravenously hungry for that type of story. Yep. 
What, and two, they had no idea. Yep. Two random facts. One, did you know that J.R. Tolkien was a South African? I did, yes. He was born in the same country as me. And number two, he didn't re uh, he didn't do rewrites. He started his book from the beginning every time he found a mistake, which is why it took him so long to write it. Yeah. Yeah, he rewrote it from the beginning a, a huge number of times, which is kind of why there's all these weird little offshoots that don't go anywhere, like Tom Bombadil and all that sort of stuff. Yep. In a properly crafted novel, none of that would have been included. Yes. And I mean, it is a very weird way to for an English professor to especially do it. But you can also, I mean, this is pre-typewriter, well, pre-electric typewriter, pre-any electrical thing. So it was pretty much handwritten. Yeah, like he started writing it when he was in the army. Yeah. Little bits and pieces. Okay. So He's in the chat, no? Lord of the Rings was not filmed in Australia, my man. It's all in New Zealand because yeah. Peter Jackson, the director, is New Zealand uh, from New Zealand. Hmm. And uh, let's be honest; I mean, New Zealand does have quite a, a wide range of uh, uh, vestiges and the correct sort of um, look and feel. I mean, I, I couldn't really picture oh, that movie being recorded anywhere else. Oh, it's the perfect scenery. Look, to get that much green in Australia, it doesn't happen, man. Well, we no, I'm in a similar country. Brown and red. Getting back to the question that kicked off the Lord of the Rings question is, why did you decide to bring it into your novel? I'm guessing it's because you enjoy the books so much. Um, yeah, partially, but it wasn't really much of a conscious decision. Like I was writing the very first chapter when he hears the voice of the of the system for the very first time, and I just thought it would be it would be amusing. If it was, um, if it was Gandalf's voice, if it was Ian McKellen's voice, hmm. <laughs> then I just had that moment where I thought, "Yeah, that's pretty funny," and I wrote that, and I liked it, so I kept it. Well, for me, on that first chapter, that was one of the biggest hooks out of the first chapters that I've read. Was that setup of that voice, and you know, I didn't quite see it coming, but then the moment you said it, it was like, "Well, okay, I'm definitely going to have to read the rest of this if this is the sort of." Uh, <laughs> light-hearted humor that's going to be throughout it. Yeah, certainly. I try to keep the light-hearted humor going throughout it. It's meant to be, uh, like, tone-wise, the novel's meant to be kind of light entertainment. It's meant to be funny. It's meant yeah. to be fun to read. Well, it's like uh, the difference between Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit for me. The Hobbit is a light-hearted and easy read, whereas Lord of the Rings is a slog. And one I've read numerous times, the other one's not so much. Yeah, the Lord of the Rings was designed to be like a very serious piece of work, whereas The Hobbit was literally designed to be read as a bedtime story. If you look at the chapters and their length, yeah, um, you know, and they're each, they're each sort of self-contained. There's like the, you know, the adventure with the trolls, and then there's the adventure with the spiders, and then there's the adventure with this... It's kind of intended that you read through one adventure, like a night. I mean, it was written for his son. Yeah, exactly. Okay, question number next. Do you plan for the way things are going, or do you do it more by the seat of your pants? So, have you planned ahead too much? Do you just see where it goes? Um, I've got the sort of broad arc of the story written down. So I kind of know where I'm trying to get to at any given moment, but it's not like heavily, heavily planned. I have actually written the end. I've written, I went forward in time and I wrote the last chapter. Okay. So there is so a I definitive end. Yeah. There was always a definitive end from before, even before I started writing, I knew how it was going to end. I'd worked it out, but uh, most of it's, Sort of the the action, exactly how things happen and in what order is very seat of the pants. But, you know, I know how the current storyline ends and then I know what the next storyline is going to be and then sort of how it progresses in a general shape. Hmm. Which I, I think for a serialized novel, which I prefer to call them rather than a web novel, but both the same sort of thing, 
I think that you kind of have to go mm. with that attitude. You can't plan out a hundreds of thousands of words long or millions of words long story. No, it'd be pretty much impossible. I mean, I checked the other day. I think Chris Loss is like 480,000 words or something. Ridiculously long like that. I mean, also, and, you look at some series and they're in the tens of millions of words and you just can't plan for that sort of length. No, it's pretty much impossible. But then I was thinking, like, geez, 400,000 words, and it's sort of only just getting started. Yeah. In some ways, like. <laughs> okay. He's still not gone into the, the second layer of the dungeon. We're still in sort of the noob zone. Well, yeah. But I think the first arc so far has been a nice build-up. Not too rushed, not too slow. I mean, you probably you find the escalation problem is significant in serialization novels. So things spiral out of control quite quickly and sort of pacing no, it's the, becomes very difficult. It's, it's the Dragon Ball Z question. Yeah. You become ultimately powerful to defeat your enemy and then you need a new enemy who's even stronger to appear out of nowhere. Yep. Then you would need to invent new ways for your main character to become more powerful. Yeah. <laughs> which, which is always a problem. I mean, and that is a problem in various forms of uh, serialized content, both in comic books and uh, series, TV series and the like. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to be very, very careful about in this novel was that the arc of um, growth for the main character in terms of powering up wasn't very sharp. Because I, I think the main, I, th I feel like the a lot of fun in in these serialized novels or web novels is uh, the sense of journeying with the MC as they as they grow stronger. Yeah, and some novels just skip that entirely, and they're just strong from the beginning. Or, or they start weak. They yeah. start weak, and then ten chapters in, they're already like well ahead of the curve. An unrealistic <sighs> curve with unrealistic. You know, everything happens perfectly, and they find the perfect treasure. And sometimes you want that sort of wish fulfillment. But also, I think mostly you also want a sort of slower, more progressive way of going about it. As long as it's mm. done in the correct way. Yeah, There's, well, I want the readers to be that... able to kind of I'll continue. enjoy the journey with Anthony. Just yeah. So they can travel along with him. They can see the progression. And so eventually when it becomes like a city-stomping enormous monster they'll be able to think back to when he was just a tiny ant yeah okay question number three what influences your story or what are your influences for the story oh man there's a lot um i read a... just hold on a second there you're just breaking up you want to try Am that I again? In? Yeah, I read an absolutely ridiculous amount of web novels. Um, cool. <laughs> so there's a lot of influences drawn from a lot of places. But, I mean, the biggest one was, uh, and I've said this quite a few times in uh, comments and such, was um, Kumo Desuga Nanika. Uh, I'm a spider, so what? The Japanese web novel. Cool. Um, That's the, the reincarnated that spider one. Yeah, reincarnated as a spider. I think the English is, uh, I'm reincarnated as a spider, so what? Or something along those lines. Yeah, that's right. I'm a spider, so what? Um, and I love that novel. That was hilarious. I really, really enjoyed it. But I found that the, the most fun part of that novel was the start, mm. where sort of she was just a monster. She was in the dungeon or in the labyrinth and uh struggling to survive and then eventually she reaches a point where she becomes sort of humanoid um and begins interacting with society and then the, the whole original kind of survival challenge you know monstrous life is is gone from the story mm. probably probably the question i get asked the most in comments um, writing the novel is will Anthony ever ever become a humanoid and uh, the answer is no he never will 
he'll be a monster all the way to the end. Okay. Well, I, I suppose you could more call him a hybrid. He's got the mind of a human and the body of a monster. So in that aspect, he is a hybrid. Hello? I think we lost Rhino. Chased him away. Can hear you though. Ah, there you are. You're back. Okay, don't worry, everybody. He didn't run away. We don't have to hunt him down. Yeah. Something lagged there. I'm not sure what it was. Ah, uh, joys of the what internet. Was I saying? Um, what was I saying? The progress of the character of Spider. I'm a spider, so what? <laughs> oh, that's right. That's what I was saying. I was saying, uh, yeah, in every in every monster reincarnated story. They are a human being in the body of a monster, like in Slime, in uh, Kumo, they're always the same. But it's usually very, very quickly in the story where they snap into some sort of human form and begin living an essentially human life. Yeah, and, um, trying to reclaim their former glory. Yeah, whereas I wanted the story to go in a very different angle where he would just embrace. He would just embrace his new life. In fact, he would prefer it even. Hmm. I mean, I, I personally, uh, with uh, that, uh, the moment she turned humanoid, I, I, I've lost interest in the story and just found something else to read. Yeah, that's where sort of my interest went downhill from that point onwards as well. Because it's not why I, I enjoyed the novel. It's not why I started reading it. It's not why I kept reading it. At that, from that point onwards, you're kind of just reading a normal reincarnation story. Yeah, with, with an overly powered individual. Because the the power escalation problem was severe in that, as far as I remember. Because the moment she became what? humanoid, her power just exploded ridiculously. Yeah, she was essentially a god. Yeah. About 150 chapters in, 200 chapters in, she was a god. Which is a lot, you know, that's a lot. Yeah. Okay, so there next of... question... What made you start writing this story? Yeah, it's a good question because I had a few ideas. Well, I, I decided I was going to try and write a web novel because I was enjoying reading them so much. And I had a bunch of ideas. Um, but this one felt the easiest to write. Okay. I mean, how long did, oh, you, yeah. did you spend coming up with this or doing the pre building to it? Quite a long time. Like I was just fiddling around. I actually I wrote the first ten chapters, and then I just I rewrote them from the start as well. I just completely tossed it up and rewrote it to try and make it flow a bit better. And I was trying to come up with how the story would go and the various little bits and pieces in the system, like how it would work. Um, to be honest, I wish I'd done a bit more prep. And in some ways, I think the novels suffer a little bit from me not having things worked out perfectly. Um, so if anybody out there is planning on writing their own system novel, try and, try and get everything nailed down before you start, and that way it feels more complete to the reader. To work on the world building. Yeah, but I did a sort of... I was poking at it for a couple of months before I published the first chapter. Well, I mean, also, I think you need to realize that the first 10 chapters sets the tone for the rest of your story, however long that is going to be. So if you're lighthearted in the first 10 chapters, it's probably going to be lighthearted for the rest. So if you're not comfortable with that 10 chapters, then you need to make sure that you do it in such a way that you can continue writing it. Yeah, exactly. But it's, it feels more authentic, you know, because you want to have this complete system that's revealed piece by piece to your character and to your readers. And um, once you've started revealing things, it's very hard to kind of start making it up on the fly. It needs yeah. to it needs to mesh together. So, ooh, just saw an interesting question in the chat. What about the reincarnated slime story? It has a humanoid in society, but he's running his own monster society. Did that make you lose interest? 
Which I lost interest in that one very, very early because he was, you know, the, the setup is great. He's reincarnated as a slime. But he gets his own overpowered skill set right from the beginning, which makes makes me lose interest a little bit. I don't really like OP protagonists that much. I think with regards then, to that specific story, uh, they were aiming more for the uh, society building rather than the overpowered MC. So being able to pull together all the different races. Although, to be perfectly honest, I haven't read that far into it. Yeah. The part of it that actually sort of really annoyed me and made me sort of stop following it entirely was when the old monsters evolve into essentially sexy humans. Mm. And the more highly evolved and more powerful they are, the sexier a human they are. I it suppose. just annoys me. It's like, what's, they're not hardly, how are they monsters? In what way are they monsters? The monster is. But so the what is it? The goblins evolve into like attractive green humans. Okay. The the oni evolve from like large powerful creatures into just attractive humans with a horn on their head. Like what's no difference? I, I think they the also the, 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 it was very difficult to differentiate between the different species. You know, th there would be these concepts, so that they're very different, and then wham. They get along with each other just because of whatever reason. Well, they are essentially all the same. I mean, I, I don't want to knock the story too badly. Like, it's a good story. The whole society building thing I thought was really well done, and that's good. And I'm certainly wanted to borrow elements of that mm. um, in Chrysalis when he's trying to, you know, this, this ant society gradually takes shape. But, um, yeah, quite right. Someone in the chat's just basically said it's fan service, and that's exactly what it is. Well, yeah, it's just fan service. Makes, there is makes a good anime. Wrong with that. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not everybody's cup of tea. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, in a monster reincarnation story, I guess what I really wanted was a monster story. And it, I sort of decided it didn't exist out there, which is one of the reasons why I thought Chrysalis might, might catch on. It might be popular. Because hmm. this kind of story where it's a monster story and it just stays monstrous. You know, sexy humans doesn't really come into it. Hmm. Uh, it didn't, doesn't exist. I just want to point out to the chat that this isn't my ant farm. This is just a random stream. And there is a link down below in case you missed earlier when I mentioned that. So it's not me moving a camera about or anything like that. It's part of the stream. But yes, uh, I, I understand what you're saying that, you know, He's uh, that monster stories tend to be well. It's monsters wanting to be humans rather than monsters wanting to stay as monsters in a realistic way. Yeah, exactly. All righty. Just trying by keeping it monstrous. You're just sort of exploring something new, I suppose. Yeah. Like it wasn't long into um, into slime that the main character gained access to a perfectly serviceable human form. If you're at that, oh, what was the point in yep. starting as a monster then? Okay, another question from the chat. Have you ever wondered if people would like your story or if you would do well amongst readers when you were writing the initial chapters? Well, you know, I hoped it would, but I never really expected it would catch on. Because it's not... It's deliberately designed to be not normal for a serialized novel or a web novel. Like the main character is not a suave, intelligent, always gets it right, overpowered guy who sort of smacks his enemies about. He's insane, <laughs> kind of crazy, stuffs up all the time and doesn't think. Well, I mean, it's always difficult when, when you're doing something new or isn't really tried and trusted, whether it's going to be popular or not. I think yeah, that right. would be with any novel, really. Even if you are trying to be formulaic about it, when you're writing, you never know because a lot of it is right time, right place, and the right people read it. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, for the first fifty chapters or whatever, you know, there was I had like thirty readers or whatever, and uh, I was perfectly happy with that. You know, I never really expected it to take off. Uh, at all. 
but mm. I was very, very happy that it did. I was very, very, you know, I was super pleased that people were enjoying it. Well, I mean, now you're up to what, almost 6,000? Uh, what, followers? Yeah. Or readers? Yep. Um, on webnovel.com, it's uh, a lot higher than that. Oh, I, I, I tend to avoid web novel. Uh, but... oh, I understand. We've got another question from the chat, and this one you may not want to answer because it is related to potential storylines, which is, will Anthony ever get thrown out of the colony or get most of his say in the colony removed with regards to the 20 taking over? Uh, well, I can say at the moment I don't plan on doing that, but you never know in the future. I mean, it, it could be an interesting, you know, you're a monster, but you're not the right type of monster. Yeah, I mean, there's potential there. There's absolutely potential. One of the things I've sort of struggled with in writing a web novel of this kind is how much of a setback is acceptable mm. to the main character. So how, how much is Anthony allowed to just have everything blow up in his face? Now, at the moment, I haven't really done that. Hmm. Well, but, I mean, um, he has struggled, and not a, some things haven't come quick to him. Yeah, Which, that's certainly true. But sort of like he's 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 never been knocked, yeah, directly on his backside and had to sort of rebuild everything, or you know, he's never had his plot foiled mm. completely in any real sense. Been really set back to zero, basically. Yeah. So you know the. Because in a novel, it's supposed to be lighthearted and fun. Um, do you really want to read about your main character's agonizing pain as things torment him? Mm. Well, I, I think that it is a very fine balancing act. Yes, yeah. it's not yeah. easy to do. How much you want the pro oh. the, your characters to progress and how much you want them to struggle. Yeah, I'll, I'll reveal here that uh, the original plan um, was actually for the Queen and the colony to get wiped out at the uh, when the wave happened. Oh, yeah. And all of them would die, and then Anthony would um, rescue the Queen's core, re-engineer it, and then uh, reconstitute the Queen as a pet. And uh, begin the colony again that way. Okay. So and that's quite how different the, that's... from what happened. Yeah, and in the end, I decided that it's uh, a bit heavy. It's a bit heavy, isn't it? That is a bit heavy. Right. Next question from the chat is: uh, How can you keep tabs on Anthony's inconsistencies in thinking and mentality while writing, since his mind is an ex-human and is now Antish? Yeah, the way I try to write Anthony is to not think too hard because he doesn't. <laughs> I suppose that's true. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, tr I've tried to sort of, yeah, I've tried to sort of get this across, but he, he is a bit mad. Yes. He's a bit insane. Well, from the bits and pieces uh, of his backstory that have come through, it is no wonder that he's a bit insane. And then you had one of the, oh, Gandalf, the voice, the original monster that plays Gandalf, telling him that he only brings broken ones across. That also is a pretty big red flag that he's not right in the head. Yeah. So he doesn't, he doesn't really think much. He just sort of does. And uh, I get a lot of flack for that. I get yeah. so many reviews of people complaining about the main character. One of the things I have noticed is some people want the main characters to make the right choice every time, the best choice, the most efficient choice, and be like the super overpowered lucky being that just gets everything right first time. When that's yeah, exactly. not really how it happens. Uh, I mean, well, it's not how it has to happen. Like if you want to read that story, if you want to read about that that main character, you've got literally hundreds of thousands of options mm. to read that story. If you want to read about uh, a nuts main character who does everything flying by the seat of his pants and does not plan ahead, 
there's not many cho- not many choices for that. And uh, there has been taken up, and I mean, there's enough people that have said yes, we do want the story. Yeah, exactly. That's really gratifying. Because it's one of the things I like. It's personally one of the things I like most about the novel and about the story is the way Anthony's just sort of, he's just crazy. He's just, he's thrown in. He doesn't really think, he just accepts. Hmm. He just accepts. And it's not as if he sort of yearns for what was before. He's actually happier. Yeah. That's what people are like. Why does he embrace the colony the way he does? Well, why wouldn't he? Why not? He's an ant. I I think the question always becomes, you know, what is part of the ant physiology and what is part of his original human? I mean, is it because he's completely broken as a human or is it partly because of his part ant? There's, you know, there's a mix in there. There are certain things that are sort of down to his ant instincts. Like you know, the way he enjoys digging so much. It feels so soothing to him. Ant zen. Uh, digging zen, yeah. Somebody the was zen of ants. Yep. Um, okay. And that's, that's obviously coming from his, his ant physiology, his ant instincts. Have I ever received thwacks in real life from my mother? Yeah, I'm old enough that uh, the wooden spoon was still in practice when I was growing up. Same. I was old <laughs> enough that we had that in school. In fact, it was encouraged. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah. There's so much of human history. Hitting our children was 100% fine. And then all of a sudden, it's just, no, don't do that. I'm not yep. saying hit your children, people. No, I'm not saying that. It no. was just such a shift. And very quickly. I mean, a funny anecdotal story for those who have never known corporal punishment. In my high school, I was halfway through high school when they removed corporal punishment from public schools. And my school was a mostly boys' school. And they, we all went on a strike. We refused to do anything. We all left the school and went outside to try and bring back corporal punishment because we didn't want any of this demerit crap. We just wanted it up for jacks and get it over and done with, and our parents didn't have to get involved. They wanted to bring it back. Wow, yeah. that's fascinating. Because uh, the, they replaced it with a demerit system. So what would happen is if you did something wrong, instead of getting a jack, you would get a demerit. And then after a certain amount of demerits, you'd have to take a letter home. And then you'd get a jack at home because you bring a stupid letter home. And you'd have <laughs> upset parents and stuff. So instead of having to deal with all of that, we just wanted jacks, you know, get it over and done with, and you'd be fine. Yeah. But it's not like the school could do anything about it because it was a government mandate. Yeah, yeah. No, I was gone in schools by the time I started, but at home when I was little. I mean, you learn pretty quickly. I remember when my mother used to just always wait on the other side of a door of a doorway, and she'd order me through it. And as I walked through, she'd give me a whack on the backside with the wooden spoon. And so I just learned to sort of try and sort of leap through the door, <laughs> use the forward momentum to lessen the impact. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that was a time's change. But, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've got kids myself now. <laughs> Certainly they never get hit. <laughs> On to more antish things. Well, kind of. This is a more serious question. Question number five. Your story is fairly light-hearted, with some darker undertones. Do you ever find it difficult to keep it light-hearted? Yeah, sometimes. I think we covered this I mean, a little bit earlier. Yeah, I mean, horrific things happen. I mean, if we think about it logically, like... Uh, the kingdom of Lyria has been completely burned to the ground by, by monsters. And, you know, we're talking about thousands of people killed. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's pretty heavy stuff. I mean, essentially but when you're it's reading a genocide. About it, yeah, it's essentially a genocide that occurred. But from Anthony's point of view, like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's, just, it's not that big a deal to him. Yeah. And so it comes across, uh, you know... It, as you read about it in the novel, it comes across pretty relaxed. 
And then also, I mean, his past when he was a human, from what little we know, it was quite horrific. But he seems to... It was great. No. But I mean, just a question that popped into my head right now is you have mentioned that he's insane. But how much of his human history is part of his insanity and how much of it wasn't a reality of what happened? Oh, so how much was his his mentality influenced by uh, his life as a human? Well, when he was a human, was he insane? And if he was, how much of his experience was because he was insane rather than it was a reality? Uh, no, his experience as a human, you know, his, his kind of particular type of of madness, his mindset was a result of his circumstances rather than the cause. Okay. Um, just a question that we did cover a bit earlier, Mahaz. It's basically, there is an overarching storyline, but it is mostly done chapter by chapter. The ending is written, Mahaz. We'll get there in like another 1,500 chapters. That's quite precise. Right, next one. Well. Um... Do you do you name all your new characters and species, like the Commando and the Sophos, and do you make stuff up there with a fixed template that you follow? I just make stuff up. Oh. I mean, the Komodo. Uh, Komodo dragons, I'm guessing. Yeah, it's from original. Komodo. Yeah. I try, you know, you always you take influence from the places, but I usually try to make it less obvious than that. And also mildly <laughs> humorous. Yeah, exactly. Because I mean, it's just one of the one of the ideas is that Pangaea, the, well, the world that he's in now, mimics the world, you know, mimics Earth in some interesting ways. Like you know, the the wildlife. There's ants. There's bears. There's rabbits. Yeah. The same basic templates, but very wildly differing end results. Mm. I have to agree, Plusium, pun names are the best names. Yes, yes, they are. And yes, the Sophos are exactly the Sophons from Endless Space. You've nailed it. Okay, how do you decide what body parts of monsters get mutations and what parts don't? I tried to make it so that uh, the most fundamental parts of that creature are the ones that can be mutated. Like the most important parts. Externally, at least. But so that's... what are the defining, the defining features of the ant, you know, like his mandibles, his uh, pheromone gland, his carapace, those sorts of things. Hmm. And plot armor. Always plot armor. Yeah, of course. There's always an element of that. It's the but, first thing. If, if you went... If you went by what was most physiologically important, you know, it would be it would have been his heart, his stomach, you know, sure. which were much less interesting. Okay, so yeah, basically the question is, so why would his stomach not get a mutation, but he gets an option to upgrade it when he evolves? Uh, this is going to be explained during his next evolution. Okay, so TBD. Keep your eyes peeled for the next evolution. All shall be revealed. <laughs> I'm liking this because people are now asking questions, so I don't have to carry on with my list. Because we started yeah, off strong, right. and I mean, we're only up to question five we've done on my list. Are there civilized races besides humans and Sophos? Uh, there are. Um, well, you said no the, uh, the Komodo are also a civilized race. Yeah, there's a whole society of Komodos. Um, that somebody has mentioned. I don't remember who talked about it. I think maybe Morelia uh, told him. But yeah, sort of to the northwest, I think they are. Um, there's a, a whole kingdom of Komodos and, then, and uh, their slaves. Slave mages. 
As well, I think you also mentioned one of the excerpt, uh, the old races, so the dwarves, the elves, the humans. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, there's no elves, there's no dwarves. Okay. One of the things I deliberately did was um, have a non, uh, a non Tolkien esque, okay, setting. So there's not going to be any uh, uh, any of those, unfortunately. Okay. But there will be, yeah, there are, there are others, though. There are others. No, sneak peek, the branches are actually a, an offshoot of a tree civilization. Okay, okay. But no spoilers. Well, that's the massive spoiler. <laughs> well, I, I did notice that you went into quite a, a fair amount of detail with the, the branches. More so than was really required, which gave me the impression that they would be uh, appearing again. So I was quite confused when they just kind of disappeared when uh, they yeah, changed I intended to, locations. I intended to bring them back like a lot quicker than uh, has eventuated. Uh, it just kind of never felt like the right moment to bring them back in. I am loving these puns, man. You should read some of your stuff on HFY. Uh, it's quite humorous. That's wonderful. Yes, wonderful. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry. Continue. But yeah, they they are <laughs> they are coming. They are coming back. I meant to do it a long time ago, but uh, they are coming. Okay. So, any other types of ants planned for this world? Termites or fire ants or something along those lines? Yeah, one of the plot lines I always wanted to do was um, a war, a colony war. Okay. Um, because interestingly enough, like a lot of the most predatory ant species, um, their favorite food is ants. Well, uh, other ants. Kind of makes sense, I suppose. But yeah, so that's the, that will happen. I don't think that's too much of a spoiler to say that eventually they will have conflict with another colony. Well, I think that we could have established that through his evolution past, that he could have become a different species without taking his colony with him. So that, that yeah. leads to the possibility that there is other types of ants out there. So yes, they will be making an appearance in the story. Well, I mean, it's mentioned right back at the start when they were trying to identify, when the Legion was trying to identify what species he was, they had a whole list. Hmm of uh, different ant monsters that have been sighted over the years. Oh, we've got tons of questions rolling in now. Okay, is the uh, Legion the strongest human organization because of their liquor? Uh, I, I, I suppose that's a bit too late for any spoilers if anybody hasn't read Chrysalis and we've way past spoiler territory. If not, go read the book <laughs> or the novel. Um, but... If you okay. haven't read it, well, if you haven't read it, why are you here? Well, well, I'm, I'm not interesting in any way to you. Well, <laughs> maybe somebody just likes to ch chill and chat, and I don't know, fling puns out. I'd imagine. Anyways, um, so is the Legion the strongest human organization because of the liquid mana baths, or will there be other human societies that are about as strong? Um, the Legion is one of the oldest and the strongest organizations that are still around. But they are not, uh, I wouldn't say they are the only ones who've achieved that level of strength. But certainly um, in terms of within the dungeon and dungeon delving, um, they're in a league of their own. Okay. okay. Which we'll explore more as we go forward. Okay. Okay. Um... Uh, do you keep all the documents uh, that you sometimes put uh, to the start of your chapters? Okay, so the excerpts. Yeah, yeah, yeah I save all the excerpts. <clears throat> the, the novel's basically all kept in one giant one-note document. Okay. And there's uh, heaps of stuff saved, like all of the monster descriptions, all the monster names, all that sort of stuff is all is all saved. That is a very Monster meta Nomicon. question. Sorry, I was just reading a question in chat, and it's a very meta question. If Anthony dies and someone reconstitutes his core, would he remain his himself, 
or would it be someone new? Uh, I see. Uh, like, <laughs> are his, are his, is his memories and personality encoded on his, uh, cool. on his core? No, they're not. Okay, so he'd be a new ant with uh, the base powers that he started off with. Yep. So just a template form. Yeah, basically yes. Okay. Well, he would, the... he would he would he'd be reconstituted at his at his current level of evolution. Okay, but but at a, a, a reduced rate until he consumes enough biomass, like all the others. Yes, yeah, so as a baby until he uh, sort of regrew. Okay. Are the dragons? Will there be dragons? Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't decided. TBD. I mean, I love dragons as much as as much as the next person, but I don't know. How do they work underground? Mm, I suppose. Although, if you look at the Oriental ones, they look more like worms than dragons. So, yeah, very long and sinuous. A for chapter when it's coming. Okay. I don't want to debate the dragons for too long. <laughs> yeah, jeez. <laughs> Okay, so uh, why would you, or why do you go for the light-hearted rather than the the broody, grim, dark stuff? Um, it's more fun to write. It's easier to write, I think. Mm. But for me personally, I think that's my kind of personality. Okay. The gritty and serious is a little harder for me to grasp to grasp hold of. All right. So, uh, why, uh, when will the or will there ever be a male ant colony or male in the ant colony? Yeah, I mean, I'm interested to thinking about that. I'm in the process of thinking about that because if you look at a real ant colony, the males have a pretty miserable life where they essentially mate, mate once and then die. Most male insects have a horrible life. Yeah, it's it's not great. And if you think about the, um, if you think about the, the the situation or the scenario within the dungeon where the monsters don't need, yeah, you know, they they reproduce asexually. Mm. There's not actually a purpose for a male. Yeah, I mean, it has been mentioned that the ants are one of the few that reproduce normally, whereas most of the others use uh, respawns. Yeah, they have to wait for the for the dungeon to spawn more of their own kind. Um, whereas the ants can can actually give birth, or at least the queen can. Okay, a random question. This isn't one I actually wrote, but it's something I thought of right now. Uh, what does it feel like to talk to, and not me, but in chat or in Discord, to possibly talk to somebody who knows more about your novels than you do? Uh, yeah, it's very disconcerting. It's really, really disconcerting. And it's something I didn't think would happen. You know, like I wrote it, right? I should know it the best. But I don't. Because I, I, I forget stuff all the time. And there are, just, there are readers out there who don't. They just, they're on it. And I think it's also... I think part of it, sorry, continue. Uh, I was just going to say, I think for part of it is just that... Um, in my mind, like I, I've considered all the different options. Mm. I've gone through, I've gone down a lot of paths and then picked one. So it all gets very, very fuzzy. Whereas to the readers, it's very definite. There's only one. Mm. And I think the other thing, which is something that I go through, is I've sat here when I do a recording. It's like I've been listening to myself talk for hours on end. When I'm done, I don't want to listen to myself talking about the same thing over again. So I don't go back no. and listen to my old videos. I'm pretty sure it's the same for you. Once you release the chapter, it's like, well, I'm done. Let's move on. Let's do something else. Let's move on to the next chapter. Yeah. Well, like sort of, I don't get that much time to write either. So I have a full-time job. You know, I've got, I've got two kids. I don't have that much time to right. sit down and write. So... You know, it's just when I sit down to write, it's basically move forward. Let's keep going. What is quality control? Indeed. Sure. Well, that's that's why there's so many. That's why there's so many errors in the 
in crystals. I think it's also very, a trap that a, or a thing that's something uh, that a lot of the serialized novels fall into. It's because you have to produce them so quickly that uh, mistakes uh, they they arrive. Yeah. Well, I mean, when I was writing the story, basically my experience of web novels was what I was reading in the sort of more on the Asian side of things, like Japanese web novels, Chinese web novels, you know, through webnovel.com and stuff like that, where quantity is really uh, the way to go. Mm. So they're massively long and all that sort of thing. And then it was only later when I came across sites like Royal Road with Western web novels and, you know, web novel authors who released once a week once a fortnight kind of thing. Mm. And I was just like, that is, what is what is wrong with these people? Once a fortnight? That's insane. Yeah. But uh, they do manage to maintain a much higher quality. But I've got a group of people who are helping to proofread. I even uh, uh, helped, helped with your earlier chapters. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's because <laughs> I'd be reading something and go, this makes no sense. But anyways... Uh, the questions are coming in fast and furious. Um, uh, this may be spoiler territory, but will there be any divine beings and interventions? Uh, there will be creatures you could think of as divine. I, I'm guessing that the 19 you've alluded to would be classified as divine beings. Yeah, they're pretty close. They're pretty much the next best thing. You know what I mean? Just blast through the next one. Uh, with, will the ant colony start making equipment like armor and other utility items? Yeah, yeah, heck yeah. Because uh, you've got the crafters as a subspecies. Yeah, that's right. The ant, the artisan um, class, essentially, is going to go into that. So you'll have ant blacksmiths. Once they figure out what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, hopefully people are seeing that there's going to be, you know, that there has already been sort of progression as the ants start to figure things out. Mm. I think we saw that with the um, core shapers, where they started with not knowing exactly what they were going to do, but then they're slowly figuring it out. Yeah, and same thing with the um, with the, uh, the the crafters sort of finding their place as engineers and creators. Mm. And then also fighting against their natural instincts of always having to do what everybody else is doing, I'd imagine. Yeah, exactly. Let's get some rail guns with lightning magic. Yeah, why not? Okay, so there's another question. So I'm not sure if this has been answered already, but our claw, uh, but the claw centipedes have an advanced profile showing the base stats but afterwards, it was never mentioned again. Will it ever return or not? Yeah, it will. So the in order to get a hold of the advanced profile, you kind of need to eat a whole heap. And um, I guess in the late lately in the chapters, I haven't been keeping track of exactly or or really specifying exactly what he's eating. Mm. Um, I mean, a couple of times, but, I, I think you've. Uh, pointed out that it's basically taking chunks out of multitude of different things that gets him to where he is. Yeah, essentially. Food for thought indeed. Hmm. It's going to be a royal rumble to see who gets the 20th great monster seat. Yep. You might be onto something there. Cool. Next question. Uh, I think we covered this a bit, was what is your uh, process for writing a chapter? Yeah. Um, I've got sort of dot point outline as to how things are going to progress. And so I just sort of sit down and look, all right, so what's happening next? Uh, it's that thing. And I just start writing. Cool. It's, uh, it's that simple, unfortunately. All righty, next one. Now we're getting into slightly more serious things. Uh, how is trying to keep the release schedule changed to life? Yeah, it's been tough. I've struggled to maintain the pace. Uh, I think in the early days it was a bit harder because I was kind of very 
I was pretty religious about making sure I published every day. I think for, there was a week there where I published twice a day oh, that's uh, cool. early on. 3,000 words a day, uh, which on top of a full-time job is pretty tough. I didn't have a lot of time for other things. Well, no, 3,000 so words really a day is that. easy. If you actually want to make sense, then it becomes difficult. Yeah, exactly. If you think about it, like how long does it take you to write that? You know, two hours? Yeah. That's two hours where you're not doing other stuff, you know? Yeah. I think my wife is already annoyed that, you know, I'm sitting in bed typing most nights. Mm. <laughs> so now that I'm, uh, so I'm allowing myself to take a day off here and there a week, uh, it's making things a lot more manageable. I, I think with, with a lot of things, whether it be web novels or, or whatever your chosen hobby or profession is, but when you're managing your own time, is to try and find a pace that you're comfortable with that your life is comfortable with. Yeah, exactly. There needs to be a balance. You need to find a balance. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah well, this is not my full-time job, man. Yeah. <laughs> this is just a hobby. Yeah. Okay, so how is your I life? Mean, I'd love to do this for a living, but uh, not feasible at the moment. Yeah. I mean, if you've got a family and kids, it, it it really is very difficult just to go, meh, I'm going to try something new. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, uh, quite rightly, a lot of time gets devoted to them, as it should. Mm. You know, this has to be, it has to go second. Because of his aversion to humanifying monsters, I'm feeling anxious about Maid Crinus. Anxious in what way? Um, is there any reason the sizes of big, powerful monsters like Mama Croc will be small compared to the other novels where the size gets blown up? Um, yeah, that was an interesting discussion, actually, because I was really hesitant about how uh, to make Garolosh. And I actually did quite a bit of research for that. I was looking into, all right, what was the largest crocodile that ever lived? What's the size of, you know, how big are dinosaurs? How tall? How long? Um, and, you know, she's bigger than a T-Rex. Mm. She's legitimately bigger than a T-Rex. Which, but if you have like, uh, your average and the size of a medium-sized dog... It's fair enough that the big crocodile is bigger than your average dinosaur. Yeah, no, so Anthony's basically the size of a desk, if you think about it. Mm. Sort of that, yeah, that height, and he's much longer than he is tall. Well, um, I, I was thinking ant. more of a, you know, your general ant, because Anthony is or has been a sort of special case. But when he went yeah, to so the colony yes. so, uh, for the first time, your average ant was the size of a large dog, if I remember correctly. Yeah. They're about the size of a large dog. If you look at it now, the soldiers are going to be bigger than that. Now, they're roughly of a size with, with him, but the others are all smaller. Um, like Vibrant is basically Anthony's size now. But the Queen is essentially a minibus, mm. is the way I think of it. So she's significantly larger. So, I mean, um, I one think... of the things I haven't been able to, one of the things I haven't been able to emphasize with Garolosh yet is just going to be the, like her, her mass. So whereas maybe she's not as long or as tall as people wanted, but she's she's thick. She's bulked. Cool. So think of a T-Rex, except with four arms and like ridiculously uh, heavy in terms of muscle mass. Tightly packed. Yeah, she's going to be dense. But people are not, not satisfied. This is not big enough. I'm like really? Well, it's not an end boss or anything. And no, she's not the end boss. That's right. And I mean, if she's still stuck in the first layer, there is a limit to her size, which I think is something that you've tried to stress with the whole Stratas. Exactly. There is an excerpt that talks about some of the largest monsters uh, that have been recorded, and um, they're big. Yeah, the monsters as we go down, they're going to get larger, larger. 
So Garolosh is kind of like the biggest, baddest thing you're ever going to find in the first layer. But it's just the first layer. Mm. This is the noob zone, guys. The tutorial you area. To, this is the tutorial area. You get down to the fourth and fifth layers. Man, it's it's going to be big. Okay. Um, a while, Chocobo asks, uh, there's fan, fic uh, fan fiction about it already, about the centipedes. Do you support com community spin-offs and other projects? There is actually yeah, two yeah, the author fan is. fictions at the moment. Uh, the centipede yeah. one and the other one is called what was its name? He who walks alone, I think, was the name of it. I'm not sure about the second one, but certainly people have approached me and asked if they could, and I said, "Yeah, for sure, go for it. Why the heck not?" Um, certainly, the author of the um, of the centipede novel, Thufia. Um, He's asked me quite a few questions about various bits and bobs and whether or not it would fit into the into the system and into the world, and I'm happy happy to answer that. That's great. Mm. I'm flattered if anything. People asking you questions about your system, you go, "That's a really good question. I should probably think about that." Sometimes, yeah. Like, oh, does it work like this? You know, I never thought of it that way. Um, are you going to be bringing in flying insects? To deal or to battle with the colony. Yeah, 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 for sure. So it's, yeah, as the lower lay layers do have bigger open spaces, yes, dragons would be a possibility down there. You are correct. Okay. Now the, so the, 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 the lower you go, the lower you go, the uh, the larger the expanses become. Okay. So is there a fungi that uh, the zombie fungi in this world? Which is a fungus uh, as there are that... in... Say again? Yeah, as there are in, uh, in in real life here on Earth. Yeah. Um, I've been asked that a couple of times, actually. I'm still thinking about that. Like, how detailed do the ecosystems need to be? And how divergent they are. Yeah, and whether or not... Um parasitic organisms uh, you know how much of a place do they have in the system hmm would they even need to function in this sort of system with evolution yeah, and like, constantly growing and the like hmm so the dungeon exists like there's a purpose behind the behind the dungeon and how well the various monster types actually suit that purpose yeah is a question that I sort of have to think about okay Question number next. We're up to 10 on my list. Uh, would you ever publish this in either a traditional or um, electric form? So, you know, on Amazon or go for a proper paperback type form? Yeah, I am. At some point, I've been meaning to start for a long time, but at some point I'm going to go back and do some rewrites and edits and tidying up all the way back to the beginning. Would you and, wait um, until the end of the first story arc as such? Uh, the first volume, I think you called it. Um, well, I, was, I was thinking of just doing like 100 chapters in one because that's already a lot of words. Mm. <laughs> if I was to bundle all that I've written so far into one, that'd be a hefty volume. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, I mean you're up to almost volume five now if you're going with 100,000 words per volume. Yeah. Which, given context, is longer than Lord of the Rings by a yeah. huge chunk. Yep. It's kind of like web novels or serialized novels in this way. That, you know, written in this style don't really suit themselves to paper publishing because <laughs> they're just so long. So Although, if I was to offer, if I was to offer people the opportunity to have it as a hardback or a paperback, it's going to cost you like you know. 20 bucks to get the um to get the first 100 chapters mm. a, a just, random, just because of printing costs a random factoid is serialized novels actually used to be a thing with newspapers and readers digest yeah so web novels aren't really new they're just new that they're free and online but the concept of a serialized novel has been around since the late 1900s uh, well, the way they're written, the way they're written has changed somewhat. Well, if it, you think about, 
it's um, technology. Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, Sherlock Holmes was a was a serialized novel. It was published in a magazine, mm. and they were sort of each a condensed. It was you know Sherlock Holmes is essentially a collection of short stories. The same with Whereas a lot of Isaac novels, Asimov stuff. Yeah, yeah. Whereas the web novels that we read today are like one continuous narrative as opposed to you know many self-contained stories. Uh, and that's what's different about them and that's what's wonderful about them is you can have this incredibly long story which goes into all the nitty-gritty following one you know, set of characters. Mm. There's no need to skip here and there. You can get the whole lot. And it, I mean, one, one of the comments that I like about something like Royal Road or, or the Western written Norwegian novels is I, I find a lot more connected to them because the sense of humor and the cultural commonalities are a lot similar to mine. So I, I connect a lot better with the westernized uh, web novels in a way that I don't really do with the uh, Japanese, the Chinese, and the Korean ones. Yeah, no, I absolutely understand that. There are some that kind of reach across the aisle, I think, that sort of present it in a way that's done well enough mm. that um, you can grasp hold of it. One of the first ones I ever read was um, Coiling Dragon. Um, and I thought that was an excellent novel. But I, I suppose it's like any sort of cultural type of writing. Very few things cross the aisle completely. Oh, yeah, totally. Okay, so the creatures so far are bigger brutish that we've seen. Are there any for agile and stealthy predators in the future which use more intelligent tactics? Yeah, the deeper you go, the sort of smarter monsters are going to get. But at the same time, the, the larger and more powerful the brutes get. So there is a bit of a balance. I don't think this is a serious question, but it is funny. Do anteaters exist in this world? I suppose uh, that would technically be anything that eats an ant. Yeah, pretty much. But I mean, I think they're specifically talking about monstrous anteaters. Um, I've been thinking about it for a little while. Like, are ant colonies sufficiently common in the dungeon that there's specifically monsters designed to kill them? Uh, and I'm not sure. I don't think so. Well, I mean, as far as I remember, the ants normally only appear at the bottom of the first strata. So, I mean, it definitely wouldn't be a surface-dwelling thing, which is the case in our reality, where no, the ants so are underground ants, and the anteaters are above ground. Ants sort of straddle the border between the first and second uh, strata. Uh, spoiler, at the end, Anthony is just in a coma. No. <laughs> no, I would not do that to you. That's lame. That is lame. I'm just looking to see if there's v any interesting questions. A VR MMO where you forget you entered. No. Come on, man. Well, that could be an interesting uh, novel. So why don't you write it, Plusium? I mean, you're not writing enough as it is. You just need to remember to put the correct title on your stuff. <laughs> What's Quadrum writing? Uh, uh, Plusium writes uh, on um, HFY on Reddit. But he started a series, but in no way did he indicate that it was part of a series. So I did a narration on it, and it actually turned out to be the second part of the series. <laughs> that would have been annoying. So, uh, yeah, I, I was bragging on him a bit by, about to actually marking things as part of a series when they were a part uh, we of a series. That. It's a nice question. We have the dungeon, but are there other dungeons? No, it's one dungeon that's global. Um, there are different differences uh, between areas, basically. So you'll get different monsters spawning in different locations uh, around the world, but it is one globally spanning dungeon. Okay, so like different continents have different environments. You're going to have different sections of the dungeon have different environments. Although I suppose that you yeah, can say that we're already seeing that if you look at the different stratas 
Because there was that one under Laria and then the one that they're currently in, which is Swamp. Yeah, that's right. So there's dungeon biomes. Yeah, that's right. So as you go around, <laughs> so as you go around, uh, as you go around the world, you'll find different monsters spawn in different locations. So you know, maybe if you were to travel 300 kilometers north, you will get a lot less claw centipedes than they do uh, where Anthony happens to be. Will we get a magma area? Yes. Uh, what's the smallest uh, creature to spawn in the dungeon? Um. So far, I think it is the Thorn Lizard. Oh, wasn't the uh, acidic snail smaller than it? I can't remember. Acidic slug? Yeah. No, the acidic slug's bigger. Oh, yeah. The Thorn Lizard is quite small. It's basically... Um... Jeez, how big would that be? It's like the... Because uh... that was like his first kill. Are oh, they going to make an his appearance again? For nostalgia purposes. They will, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Question of mine, number next. Number 11. We're getting there. Uh, do you read joke books and watch comedies to store up some jokes for your story? No, I don't. So off, all off the cuff? Pretty much, yeah. If I think of something funny, I'll try and put it in. Well, maybe Usually you... I'll just come up with Maybe you need I'll to hire Pusium sort of as your, your pun writer. Man, he's on fire, this guy. <laughs> Imagine being original. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not in the web novel business, buddy. There's no room for originality here. No. Well, uh, it's funny. If you look at most media forms, everybody goes, you know, we want original stuff. So they'll re release an original movie or original book. Nobody buys it. But they'll release a copy or a remake or a redo. And then it sells three trillion copies. And it's like, well, you're paying with your wallet to tell people what you want. I think we've chased Rhino away again. I can hear you. There we go. Well, we got him back. It's too many questions. You're scaring him. You're scaring him. Slow down. Don't want to scare him away. <laughs> China says no. <laughs> My favorite jokes are the densest brick tiny jokes. Yeah, uh, I love I love tiny. Uh, Pete Peterson. So I draw inspiration from I'm a Spider, so what? Yeah, definitely. That was the primary motivator. That was the primary inspiration for the story. Okay, and then what is Gandalf planning by observing and experimenting the entire species in the dungeon? What is his end goal? That is literally giving away the end of the novel. And I won't do that. Spoilers. Okay, my next question. <laughs> Number 12. Uh, your story doesn't have any swearing that I can think of offhand, any specific reason. I think the the worst word I can remember is damn it. Yeah, I wanted to keep it kid friendly. So PG. It's a lighthearted novel. There's, well, yeah, there's a lighthearted story. There's no need for excessive violence or heaps of swearing or anything like that. There's no need. No excessive violence. There's basically just violence with humor in between. But a light heart and violence. Yeah, but it's not you're not wrong, but it's not gruesome violence. No. Well, I don't know. I it, it's quite a, graphic when you say that Tiny hits something and it turns into paste. Yeah, but I don't talk about him being like showered in gore and blood, you know what I mean? Uh yeah. Well But you do lightheartedly. Yeah, cartoon violence. I lightheartedly do it. It's cartoon violence, exactly. Well phrased. So my youngest son started reading the novel the other day. Okay. And, you know, I try to keep it a level where I'm comfortable with that. Okay. Uh... <laughs> Anthony eating lots of corpses. Yeah. I try to never refer to them as corpses. As soon as a monster dies, it's referred to as biomass. Uh, once the novel is finished, will you release the setting for other people to make fan fictions of your novel? Yeah, of course. I'm happy to do that. 
Um, but I'm pretty sure that if you want to write a fan fiction, you can do so right now. There's already two. I'm yeah, go crazy, man. Hit me up on Discord. Ask any questions you want. So that's probably a good thing. You just give me a second. Uh, let me get the Discord link. He says, does like he knows how to do this. <laughs> If you look on any one of his stories on Royal Road, um, you can hit up the Discord server there. Look at the novel description. Hmm. Um, and uh, there are, every now and again, we get into a discussion about the aspects of the novel. Hey, Chef Anthony prepares his biomass. Yeah, what would be the point, man? He's a monster. He's just going to eat. I do, I do get you, though. Hmm. Okay, what do we got? We got for whom did you base Tiny's character? From whom um, did you base his character? Nobody in particular. Yeah, the Tiny just sort of organically existed as Tiny. That's quite funny, Lucian. Uh, <laughs> Doom Eternal. <laughs> no, no, remember, kids, violence doesn't count if it's cartoons, so beat your wife who all you want. Yikes. <laughs> you know, I was young enough to grow up on Warner Brothers cartoons, man. Yes, I, I, I remember those as well. Okay, uh, what would you say to anyone thinking about starting their own novel? Go for it. Crack in. Any That's advice fun. that you, you can offer to uh, an aspiring person, maybe thinking about getting into it, but putting it off? Um, just start, I guess. That's sort of what it took for me as it just sort of started. And once you start, um, it's easier to keep going because you're thinking about it already. So how often in um, a day do you think about your novel? At your full-time job, talking with the family, playing with the kids? Uh, a lot. You know, cause it doesn't take much, you know, you don't need that much time. You're making yourself a coffee. You can think about it. You're driving to work. You can think about it. So I sort of think about it a lot. I think I've always been a, the kind of person who thought about stories a lot. Pete Peterson, so I'd just like new. to point out that it wasn't me that got the numbering wrong. It was a certain author that got the numbering wrong. <laughs> who could have done that? So my numbering is right. I, I I do not kind of debate this. If you think that the numbering is, is if you think that numbering is wrong, then go ahead and complain to the person or people that are responsible for incorrect numbering. Yeah, the Sheila Booth inspirational video. I thought of it as I was saying it. Uh, uh, I it was too late. I was already committed. But to some extent, like to some extent. I have to admit, it's it is actually good advice. Just just start doing it. If you think to yourself, "Man, I'd really like to do that," okay, we'll just start. I, I think that's the case with a lot of things. You know, doing it is better than thinking about doing it, unless there is a practical yeah. reason why you're not doing it. Well, of course, of course, those sort of things come into consideration. But like, I was thinking about web novels and reading web novels all the time. And then I thought, okay, well, what if I wrote my own? I've always wanted to write a story to be it'd be good fun. And then eventually, I started planning it. You know, I just started planning it. I just started writing writing things down, little bits and pieces. Well, a wild chukaboo. I have a backdrop every time I eat beans. So I don't know whether that helps. <laughs> Okay, is there a skill that lets you just... share experience with your pets or vice versa? Yeah, there is. Yeah. So there's kind of built into the system, there's the ability to go a essentially a pet route, you know what I mean? Like like the sophos, basically, from what I can gather. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you can you can uh develop a zookeeper build, I guess you would say. Hmm. Hey, chapter. So Anthony, yeah, Anthony has some of those skills, and he'll probably pick up more as he goes along. Hmm. Well, I, I do remember that there were some that he didn't select. Yeah, that's right. 
How much can Anthony deadlift? Yeah, come on, man. Well, I mean, he, he drags Krenis around on his back, which is a, a stomach, or well, interdimensional stomach, so quite a lot, I'd imagine. Yeah, he's pretty strong. Not as much as Tiny, I'll say that. It's children's in the background. Lesser humans, they haven't evolved yet. They need more biomass. <laughs> Oh, hang on, my cat's here. I like cat. I'm actually surprised my cat hasn't decided just to sit here and meow at the microphone, which it does sometimes when I'm recording. For no reason, really. There's no flexibility or perception stat in my system. Yeah, when I was designing the system, I wanted to keep the um, actual statistics sort of simple and clean. Um, and I decided I made a deliberate decision not to go with a um, sort of a D and D based kind of stats system, which a lot of the novels do. Uh, does the wor uh, church, the Church of the Path, do they have a giant statue of Gandalf? Oh, they do. Yeah, <laughs> they actually do. <laughs> I think you actually mentioned that in one of the excerpts, if I remember. Correctly. Yeah, when he. Uh, when he, when he, when Anthony actually popped up in the church, there was a statue of Sir, of Ian McKellen hmm. inside. But uh, at the main sort of main church, at the main temple, do they have a, a super big one? Yeah, they do. Right, do you have the skill system written down, and do the monsters have access to the same skills as the MC and other ants, or are the skills yeah, unique do. or individual? Uh, well. So there's generic skills and there's unlockable skills, right? Mm. So some skills are not available to some monsters. Like um, Crinus, for example, has a lot of tentacle-based skills, um, which are obviously not available to to Anthony. He can't get them. And Crinus has restricted access to the eye-related skills because you can't really get exactly. Eyes. Yep. So it is It is based on physiology and what they can actually access. But it, generically speaking, uh, everybody has access to the same skills. Okay. My number nine, number question number 14. Very, very difficult question. You can take your time to think about it if you want. Do you own an ant farm or have you ever owned an ant farm? I think you touched on this a bit earlier. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Do you currently have one? Uh, right now, though. No. I just have this image of you sitting, staring at the ant farm, writing the next chapter. <laughs> no, naming no, naming all the ants with the ant puns. Yeah, that'd be a good way to go, wouldn't it? Mm. Thousands of ant puns. Mm. I don't currently have one, but I have had one in the past, yeah. I think a few people have mentioned in the comments uh, the Ants Canada YouTube channel. Okay. And yeah, I was watching that. For, I was watching that for a while. And I thought, well, yeah, why the heck not? And I went out and uh, caught a queen ant and started a colony. King, king. We'll have to go soon, though, Agro. Okay, let's just quickly move Sorry. on to my questions. Finish my questions. Uh, shouldn't be too much more. Four more questions from me. And then this should go quickly. Why do you not like centipedes? I just don't like centipedes, man. <laughs> have you seen them? No, I don't have them in my country. I've got millipedes. Yeah, millipedes are much less offensive. Yeah. Oh. Well, I've got millipedes the size of small snakes. Okay, well, that's less, that's, that's less appealing. Okay, uh, how do you handle criticism and negative comments on your work? Uh, yeah. At first, I guess it was a bit, it was harder to deal with. Now I'm kind of over it. Let the chips lie where they fall. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Like constructive feedback is always welcome. I still get frustrated by 
I still get frustrated by uh, people complaining about stuff that's like literally built into the foundations of the novel. Mm. Like if you if you don't like the way the main character is written or the way he behaves, why are you reading it, man? <laughs> well, I, I think you get some people just hate read. I don't like it, so I'm going to read it and find everything I can find wrong with it. Yeah. I guess it's like it's clearly by choice, right? It's clearly a deliberate decision. Oh, it's not like you <laughs> accidentally read it. Okay, so if well, you no, had I to mean, recommend like, a novel to somebody, what would it be, or to your readers and fans? Oh, jeez. If I had to recommend one mm. web novel, mm. gosh, that's tough. I don't really have a favorite, you know? It's like you have favorites for different types of novel. Mm. That's true. But um, seeing as I, I'd imagine if um, I'm a spider, so what is your inspiration? Maybe some people would want to check that out. Yeah, absolutely. If you've never read I'm a spider, so Kumo Desuka Nani Ka in the Japanese, uh, certainly go read that, especially the first you know, sort of arcs. That's where Crystal Stewart's inspiration from. It's really, really... Uh, entertaining read other than that um if i was to recommend just one in general i would probably say uh, go read worm right now this one is a sort of a, a free open question if you could say anything to your fans what would you say get stuffed no <laughs> um look i mean it's just generic but uh Thanks. Like, <laughs> thank you for reading. It really means a lot. I get a lot of joy just reading comments and reading reviews and and just knowing that people enjoy it. Like, it uh, makes a makes a huge difference. Mm. Okay. And then number nineteen, my last. Oh, yeah, my last question, and one more after that. I got from a fan earlier. But my last question is, uh, if you could say anything to people who haven't read your novel, what would you say? To people who haven't read it? Mm -hmm. um, if Other you're looking than... for a slightly different... What's your sales If you're looking pitch? for a slightly different web novel experience, if you're looking for something that's a bit silly, a bit light, a bit out there, um, feel free to give this novel a try. Cool. Okay. So I've got a question from a wild chocobo quite a bit earlier even though it was in the chat earlier. So if you got isekai by uh, which method would you prefer? And it took a bit of clarification. It means if you were to use one of the typical ways that an isekai character gets killed, what would the way you would be killed be? Oh, boy. So for instance, would it be the classic truckkin or old age or God made a mistake, so on and so forth? Um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to go past an old classic, like pushing someone out of the way of a not speeding truck, but, uh, <laughs> I don't know why. Um, the other novel that I started publishing on Royal Road lately, um, the way the main character in that one died popped into my head. And for some reason I thought it was hilarious. And he died by a traffic heli helicopter crashing into his office building. That's a, a very ironic way of dying. <laughs> That's a, is, for some is, reason, I thought that was hilarious. It is quite funny. And this one I've seen so how I would go. a couple times. Now, what's the ratio between Earth and Pangera? Uh, this actually has been specified. Um, the The... The radius of Pangaea, so the distance from the center of the world to the to the surface, is uh, about ten thousand kilometers, which is um. Oh, what's Earth's again? Uh, uh, nine uh, let me thousand just quickly... diameter, I think. Google six thousand six thousand three hundred. Oh, time ratio. Sorry, my bad. Time ratio. Oh, the time ratio. Yeah. Oh. Well. I'll finish answering that other question since it's a good question anyway. Um, so Pangaea is significantly larger than it. Um, and the space, like the area inside it, is much, much larger. Hmm. 
And it's but hollow and made ratio. of Swiss cheese. Yeah, essentially. Which would uh, not be a good idea for a world if it, for, you know, magic. It's fine. Plot armor. It's the, it's the best type of armor. Okay, so the time ratio. I think we are having a bit of a lag spike again. Either that or he's eaten by ants. Serious lag spike. And lots of complicated questions coming in as well. Just give me one second. I'm just going to try and reconnect with Rhino. And we can end off the stream. Maybe. I think we've lost him for good. You're not muted on my side. Technical dis there we go. My back. You're back. Hey. Yeah, I'm in Australia, guys. Uh, I, we didn't really get an answer with the time difference. What is the time scale between uh, the, the two? You know, I've not actually sat down and worked it out exactly. But uh, time is faster on Pangaea. I haven't decided how much. And rather sciencey question: If Pangaea is a larger planet with less density, how is its gravity related to Earth? Uh, its gravity is slightly larger. Okay. But uh, how does that explain the big boy monsters? Magic, my man. They have mana. Seems like a hellish wasteland. You know, I can't even be offended by that. 90% of the country is a hellish wasteland. <laughs> okay. So, uh, any other quick things you want to say? Anything else you can think of? Well, I'd like to say thanks to you, man, for approaching me and uh, taking the incredible long amount of time to actually read this thing. Well, I'm not the only one who's taken the amount of time to read it. I'm just the only one who recorded myself reading it and reading yeah, it out reading loud. reading it out loud. <laughs> but it is my pleasure. And it is a fun story to read. And it was uh, you, one of the first ones that on Real Royal Road that said yes. So, oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Uh, if anyone's ever approached me to do anything with the story, I don't think I've ever said no. Uh, Tiny or Crinus, can I pick my favorite? No, man. Do not make me choose. Okay. Um, not seeing. Uh, if you get more mutations, you can unlock more skills. So, yeah, if you add, for example, if Anthony were to add wings to his body, he would unlock uh, skills related to flying. Okay, so your skills would be directly related to your physiology. Yeah. So, for example, he's got the exoskeleton defense skill, which if you don't have an exoskeleton, you're not going to get. Got some really complicated questions coming in. Must be uh, challenging your worldview. Does radiation affect mutations? No. Okay, guys, I think uh, Rhino has to be off and do family things. And we've been going yeah. for almost two hours already, which it's been fun. I've enjoyed myself. Hope everybody else has enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks very much for the opportunity to have a chat. Thanks for the questions, guys. Really, it's been fun. Uh, I'm sure I speak for everyone, and thank you for, for doing this for us all. I'm pretty sure a lot of people got a lot of stuff cleared up that they were curious about, possibly giving you some stuff to think about for future chapters. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's good when people ask questions. Okay, and yeah, join the Discord, have a chat, definitely read if you haven't read it. And 
obviously, I'm going to recommend that you listen to the audiobook numerous times as well. I mean, I'm not biased <laughs> about this or anything, but it is the best Christmas Oyoru book that I've heard personally. So you can take that as gospel at this point. Yeah, that's my seal of approval. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. And we'll see you next time. Um, just for an update of what's going to be happening with the chapters now that we are all caught up. I will be waiting for the five chapters to be released. And when we have five chapters, I'll release another video. I will wait about two days just to make sure that any corrections to the chapter have been made. That's a good idea, yeah. <laughs> it's something I've, I've noticed with a lot of the novels. The first, Really, the first 24 hours, there will be people in the chat or in the comment section uh, doing corrections. So I would rather wait until things are a bit settled down before I make the audio of it. Mm. Yeah, please assume you nailed it, buddy. Okay, and then we'll probably have another Q&A at, I don't know, let's go with uh, Chapter 700. <laughs> God. All right, let's do it. Cool. Thank you very much, everybody. And this is going to be the end of the stream. Cheers. Bye.